And uh, before I introduce my next guest, just very briefly, when I was a musician, sometimes we would listen to a band or another musician and the judgment would be they're technically great or they're technically competent, but they just don't have any soul. And it seems to me, and this is one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to Robert Johnson, it seems to me economics has the same problem. Uh, And he's the perfect guy to talk to about it, in my view. Robert Johnson is the executive director of the Institute for New Economic Thinking, or INET. He's also the host of INET's new podcast, Economics and beyond. And it's that liminal space, that connection between the economics and the beyond that I wanted to talk about. Rob Johnson uh, is also uh, knowledgeable and experienced in music. And it seemed to me that that connection uh, was perfect for talking about the soul of economics, uh, what it could be, where it went, if, if it used to exist, and how to get it back. So without any further ado, Robert Johnson, uh, welcome to the Zero Hour. So we got the uh, the conversation of two RJs here. And, That's it. Uh, I, and sometimes, you know, I see emails from you with the RJ on it. Uh, right. Right. I didn't write that. <laughs> yeah. The, so, um, yeah, it's kind of a mirror neuron experience. So, uh, first of all, the soul of economics, it seems to me that one of the things that's marked your work and, you know, you're an economist with a very distinguished background there, uh, but you're also, and it's clear with your work at INET and your writing and your speaking and now your podcast, uh, you, uh, it seems to me you feel that economics either doesn't have any soul or if it had any soul, it lost it. We need to bring it back. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think when it's, uh, when it's right, when it's aligned with social purpose, and what I mean by that is a deep moral and spiritual sensibility that economics can illuminate a great deal. But I think the economics that we've seen uh, in the last few years has really three or four critical flaws. Uh, And at some level, what critics of neoliberalism would talk about is that in many ways, economics, instead of being the public good of expertise, has been commodified as a form of marketing for wealth and power. And the people who provide that marketing, calling themselves experts or professors or government leaders, benefit personally a great deal, but to the detriment of a broad range uh, of social, uh, a broad range of society and a broad range of social issues are, are refracted and contorted. The other thing that happens that kind of, which you might call withers the soul of economics is when people understand the Uh, structure of power in society, they may be deterred. My good friend Julian Tett from the Financial Times is a cultural anthropologist, and I asked her when I started INET, give me some advice. And she said, Rob, study the silences, because the map of power will be revealed by what was not said. So doing the marketing is an error of commission, avoiding controversy, hiding in the monastery is an error of omission. And the error of omission sometimes is compounded by these rituals playing with mathematical and statistical technique, demonstrating your dexterity and your acumen as a substitute for dealing with real problems. And then finally, the one that I find most complicated and most difficult in I would say INET was really founded around. I was inspired to become an economist by a man named Charles Kindleberger, who wrote a famous book called Manias, Panics, and Crashes. And I worked, as you know, for a number of years with George Soros, who wrote the book, The Alchemy of Finance. And that is the question of uncertainty. When people are uncertain, they are fearful. And there is always a temptation to be a demagogue and present the notion that you know, or the notion that you're in command, or the notion that it will be orderly under your guidance and leadership. And what I I find quite haunting, particularly in the realm of finance, is this pretense that they know, or pretense of certainty, when in fact things are not known. And some of the great economists, like Frank Knight at University of Chicago and John Maynard Keynes, 
really understood what they call radical uncertainty, and they understood how to be experts, but to be humble about what they didn't know. And often what happens is when somebody acts like they know a lot, they get unmasked. And then the person who was the demagogue and the hero gets discredited, society rejects them, and it tarnishes the reputation of expertise and the economics profession as a whole to engage in widespread demagoguery, even though the audience was complicit in that yearning for a false certainty. You know, Rob, there, uh, I have so many, uh, Robert Johnson, I have so many uh, thoughts about that. One of them is, you know, uh, I've commented before that there uh, a certain class of economists believes that everyone is an economic actor acting in self-interest except themselves and other economists. And they, they somehow, ex <laughs> you know, right? I mean, they exempt themselves somehow from the forces that they believe are, are, are assert are universal. Uh, um, number one is one, one reaction I have. Uh, another is that it struck me for a long time that, uh, you know, you talked about the, the, uh, the uh, mathematical side of it. And uh, which to me, uh, you use the word dexterity, it reminds me of, you know, guitar players when they're checking each other out. You know, some guy may be a shredder, so I usually yeah. a guy. Uh, he can go so fast or she scale, run, run scales like nobody's business, but there's no heart in it. And yeah. to me, the, the heart of economics emerges if and when uh, econ the economist recognizes uh, you talked about the limits of knowledge that e economics is not a hard science. I, I saw in your bio that you, you you also got a degree in electrical engineering. Well, that's a pretty hard science. You know, the circuit working properly, uh, the power will flow. If it's not designed properly, if it's broken, it won't. Uh, that economics somehow to me has to acknowledge that it is in large part a social science and therefore almost bordering on literature. Uh, as well as, in the interpretation of human nature and human behavior, as well as the quantifiable and mathematical, it seems to me that that's the that's where the heart gets left out. But what what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think uh, you're exactly right, and as you, you've mentioned at the outset, I've been very involved in music. My father was both a jazz pianist of great skill and a uh, physician in the city of Detroit. My mother was a singer, a choral singer and then eventually development director with the Detroit Symphony. And I grew up in a household where music was more truth. I could come home from sports practice and I could listen to my dad's left hand on the piano and how my mom sang along in the kitchen. I could see if they were getting along, if he was in a bad mood, whether I could tell him about a bad report card, ask for the car keys or ask for money. And music always gave me what you might call a barometer on the emotional context within my own home and obviously through the 60s, 70s in particular and, and beyond, uh, uh, it creates sort of a lightning bolt of awareness about social conditions. I remember Randy Weston, the famous uh, jazz pianist who died a couple of years ago in his 90s, and he said that he was talking with a man named Musef, who was a uh, prophet and uh, in the Muslim world, and he said, uh, when you understand the quality of music, you understand the condition of society. And uh, mm -hmm. I remember Randy said that on uh, Amy Goodman's show one morning. I'll provide you the uh, little clip. I still have it in my files. But uh, but yeah, I said, I so, I, so what I guess I'm saying is I don't think anything is devoid of emotion. People worry about things becoming too emotional, so they think if they're analeptic, analytical, scientific, and dispassionate somehow avoids what you might call reactiveness and errors being made. On the other hand, if you become saccharine and frozen and fearful of the context in which you live and you pretend to be scientific, you're, you're not. You're, it's scientism is a ritual, and it's not illuminating. Though good scientists are always valuable, just like good poets and good musicians. You know, uh, again, Rob, so many thoughts, one of which is even good scientists, uh, uh, the best of them, I think, channel something spiritual at times. Uh, you know, I'm thinking oh, yeah. of, you know, uh, the <laughs> times that, 
I, I think it was Murray Gell-Mann or one of the physicists saying that, you know, uh, he was inspired by the Bhagavad Gita to come up with, uh, a, or the Eightfold Path of Buddhism it was to come up with, to, to help them break through a particle problem. Uh, yeah. And just quick story that you've, you, you've already given two great quotes, Randy Weston's and, um, and uh, the first one about the silences, which I thought was amazing. And uh, it just reminded me of you and I have briefly talked uh, by email about the fact that Jimmy Garrison, John Coltrane, Coltrane's bass player, used to be my teacher. And wow. when he took me on, the first thing he said to me is, you know, he wanted to know if I was good enough to be his student. So he gave me a bass and said, break down a D13 chord, which I had absolutely, I didn't even know what <laughs> I didn't even know what he meant, but I tried to like kind of run, you know, the the intervals in a D13 chord. And he said, you know, I don't think you're uh, you're competent enough to be my student. Why do you want to be my student? And I said, well, anybody can teach me the me I was like 17. I said, well, anybody can teach me the mechanics of how to play the notes. But listening to you, you know how to about the silence between the notes. And yeah. that's that that's what I want to learn. And he said, OK, I'll take you. And <laughs> that was a good response, man. You were on target. That was good. Man, I, I finally said, I can't afford the lessons. He said, uh, you can, I'll teach you for free. And uh, I said, I can't afford, afford the bus ferry. And he said, I'll pay your bus ferry. I said, I can't, you know, I can't do that. For those guys, it was like um, a religious devotion, right? Yes, it music. was. And yeah. um, I'm wondering if that happens in economics too, that kind of, passionate attachment because those guys were technically amazing they knew more about music than most you know uh, uh musicologists um i mean those books you've probably seen them about kind of blue those uh, and where it came oh from yeah and, ashley khan's books and uh, yeah right yeah. exactly yeah. so uh, i mean it, it, are there economists uh present company uh, uh, uh exempted are there economists out there who have that same combination of technical acumen and deep soul and spirituality oh i think there are uh yesterday a guy who's now a senior fellow at, at inet jeffrey mann who wrote a book called climate leviathan he's up in british columbia i think he's extremely soulful and extremely kind of deep and interesting a woman who does a lot of work on the diseases of despair shannon Monat has an extraordinary spirit. Uh, there are many, how would I say, I mean, I, I think Joe Stiglitz has mm -hmm. a great heart. I think Michael Spence has a great heart. I had a beautiful talk the other night with a man named Andrew Sheng, who's uh, in Malaysia, Malaysian Chinese. And I, I hope to, I guess I hope to answer that, your question by example over the next 100 podcasts I make. That uh, there, and they won't all be with economists, but but I believe there is a a core, and I think there is a chance now, with the way in which this dogmatic framework has come unraveled, been unmasked by the pandemic, by the incipient pressures of climate change, by social unsustainability and inequality, that young people are going to rise to this challenge. You're and my friend, the late William Grider set up mm -hmm. a website in 20, 2009. He and I were very close, and we talked about it a lot. And the first posting he made was, I come to my work with faith in young people because they have fresh eyes, they see what is needed, and they, do not, they have not been conditioned by what is feasible. And I think changing what is feasible is a soulful purpose, particularly when the evidence of distress and dysfunction is so widespread as it is in the world today. And again, we're talking with economist Robert Johnson, who uh, of the Institute for New Economic Thinking and host of the new podcast, uh, Economics and Beyond. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned our mutual friend, Bill Greider, who I miss. Who was talking about a guy with soul, right? I mean, he oh. and he brought and he brought it to his his work. Um, so he, he had a book called "The Soul of Capitalism," and uh, 
what, uh, secrets of the temple uh, secrets of the temple i know i i don't i don't i haven't read the soul of capitalism and, and what was it if i may ask uh, what was his thesis what was the thinking behind that title it was about the moral purpose you know his last book was called come home america which was a rallying uh -huh. cry for broad-based action to reform our society and our economy to align it with a more whole, wholesome purpose. And the soul of capitalism, and uh, before that one, one world ready or not, anticipating the challenge of globalism, all of Bill's work was guided by those, uh, what I'll call moral vision. And, and I think there were a lot of economists, you know, we, you're asking about soulful economists. I think Dean Baker uh -huh. is a soulful economist. I think he's a guy uh -huh. that, that reaches toward real problems. And uh, I think, I mean, I think Mark Carney, who's the governor of the Bank of England, is a soulful guy. I've actually done events with him in the UK where I've been a commenter. He's been the dinner speaker. And he's talking about the need to bring moral and ethical discourse back into economics. He's about to leave the Bank of England and become a special uh, envoy, or I can't remember the title, vis-a-vis -vis climate change working with the United Nations. But there are, there are, how would I say, there is a stale paradigm, there is a control mechanism, which I'll call the, the coercion of the peer-reviewed journals. There's the pressure of money and prestige and facing power that we talked about earlier. But there are a lot of well-meaning people embedded in striving and struggling in, in this profession. Well, that's good to know. And I think the more, you know, the more people show their heart, the more the more other people are willing to join them. If, if you if you get what I'm driving at. And yeah. one of the things one of the things, Robert Johnson, I've always struggled with in my journalism when I, when I deal with economic issues and and Bill Greider is such a perfect uh, um, role model for that is I always there's a part of me that always says, well, you're getting too polemical now um, or you're getting too personal now. But Bill was always a great example of how he, you know, he, he had a f devotion to the facts and to getting the story right. Um, but he was unafraid to let you know, to state his case passionately. And um, I personally would like to see more economists willing to do that. Um, I, I'm thinking also of uh, one of the federal, uh, you know, sometimes it appears in a, what to me are unexpected places. One of the Federal Reserve presidents might have been Dudley talked very openly about corruption in the financial sector. Uh, I didn't see it coming, but it was a very heartfelt and uh, and strong statement. So I'm just wondering how would the economics community uh, encourage more passion and soul uh, within itself, if you understand my question. Well, I think this is about um, an evolution. Obviously, we're in in relation to events right now. To talk sterile, antiseptic, or uh, or play a kind of what in music you'd call a cutting contest with your acumen and your tools right. seems right. kind of useless. It seems like. Uh, how would I say you? It's it's like lacking of imagination. It's missing the beat that we have to respond to as a society right now. And I, I don't know how to, uh, what you might call, take the people out of the tower who think they are controlling the profession. In other words, calming it down, sobering it up, because I think there's a, there's a very powerful balance between uh, sobering up and being sterile. And you've got to find that intersection. I remember the Jungian psychologist, James Hillman, wrote a wonderful book called The Thought of the Heart and the Soul of the World, and uh, kind of reversing how mind is usually associated with thought and heart with soul. And I feel like, we might say, crossing those wires a little bit, reincorporating history, which is a uh, multidisciplinary synthesis 
devoted to explaining a problem. I think I think there's just a lot that's got to be opened up, and I think there's a lot of uh, how they say impetus to do that. When, as I say, something like the the pandemic has ripped the mask off of the staleness of the paradigm. This is a hell of a violent thing to have happen. And these fault lines, if you will, were hiding in plain sight. I didn't, I'm not saying I recognized them ex ante. I'm saying we all now recognize them. So, it, but if we all rec recognize them, Robert Johnson, here's my fear. Uh, and, and this connects to, you know, the potential absence of soul in economics. We had the financial crisis of 2008, and for a while it seemed like the people who didn't get it, who didn't see it coming, who ignored the warning signs. You mentioned Dean Baker saw warning signs. Other people saw warning signs, but a lot of people didn't. You had comments uh, you had the, you know, defensive comments. I think Ben Bernanke said nobody I knew saw it coming. Well, you know, and not to, you know, be overly rough on him, but then maybe, you know, you should widen, you know, the, your associations to people who did know them, but that was one reaction. But we did see in the beginning, a lot of reassessment by people like Alan Greenspan saying, you know, uh, maybe banks are too big to fail by people like Bill Clinton, who was a major salesperson for, uh, you know, what I would call a broken economic order saying, yeah, oh, well, maybe we should reassess that deregulation. But then it seemed as if the, the, the community kind of circled like Buffalo on, you know, the Discovery Channel circling a wounded. <laughs> Circle the wagons, you know I mean? yeah. <laughs> you, you know what I'm talking about. A yeah. And uh, and all of a sudden, within a year or two, it was like, no, no, no. You know, it was all forgotten, the mistakes of the uh, pre of the decades leading up to 2008. Uh, in my optimistic moments, I think, well, we really are going to, uh, all of us uh, are going to have some lasting insights as a result of this pandemic and the economic crisis. But I have the fear that, we're going to lack the soul and this and the self-reflection, including economists, but you know, people who write about it, people who talk about it, politicians. That everybody, you know, if we come out of it uh, relatively intact, that everybody's going to go back to saying, "Nah, you know, the system worked. We're okay." And uh, that's my fear. Is a what do you think? Am I worrying too much or? Oh, I think uh, worrying about those what I'll call reactionary forces is is warranted, but I think the scope and scale of this disruption is so large, it's going to transform the nature of the economy, the nature of globalization in irreversible ways, and I I don't think they can put this genie back in the bottle. I I I, I believe that you know the old Chinese saying crisis is opportunity, and I really think. That, this you you look like a fool now defending the status quo or the orthodoxy and uh so i i see a different if i'm putting probability weights on the unknowable <laughs> i uh -huh. would lead in the direction of of an evolution rather than a retrenchment at this point though i will say to you one of my favorite books i've ever read is by a man named stephen toolman called cosmopolis and he studies from the time of the Thirty Years' War up to the uh, kind of second term of Ronald Reagan. And what he says is you can look at the Cartesian Enlightenment, uh, particularly as it's adapted to social science, like you were talking about earlier, and you can see fault lines. And every time there's a social crisis and everybody gets scared, they reach back to the familiar rather than forward to the evolution. And I think that right now is the mission of experts. That's the mission of INET is to help us evolve, not what you might call retrench and make the same mistakes again and again and again. And right now, the uh, climate uh, dangers beckon and the social notion, you know, the, what was it? Martin Luther King said, we all came in on different ships, but we're in the same boat now. Right. Well, that's right. not it. That is not entirely true in the sense that some people have a lot better life rafts than others. But right. uh, but the pandemic can reach people across the spectrum. And uh, I think understanding social collective responsibility is, will be heightened by what, what uh, has unfolded in recent weeks. 
it feels to me, Robert Johnson, like uh, as if um, the general public's uh, perception is certainly way ahead of uh, our national leaders' uh, actions. Uh, uh, of course, you know, you know, I don't. I think we don't even need to elaborate on what's misguided about the Trump administration's response. But I'm not seeing uh, in Congress. Uh, a lot. Of, well, I see the progressives are coming up with really good ideas. Uh, you know, Rokana and Pramila Jayapal and those people, Bernie okay. Sanders in the Senate, um, Elizabeth Warren. But, but by and large, I'm seeing you know the Democratic leadership going along with a kind of bailout program that reinforces the old modes of thinking and yeah. the governance that, that goes along with it. So I'm wondering. I mean, you guys at INET. Are, are a counterforce to that. We try, you know, those of us, some of us in the media try to be a, a counterforce to it as well. But it, 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 I'm wondering the extent to which, in your perception, uh, the economics profession, for example, is looking at, at this and saying, uh, we need to explain why our current economic system and our current political economy failed to plan for something easily predictable, a pandemic, and has failed to respond in the appropriate ways. Uh, uh, for example, you guys published Thomas Ferguson, and, and, and I've had right. uh, uh, Tom and his collaborators on great explanations of the role of money in politics. But the whole concept of a political economy, uh, the intersection between politics and economics, seems to me that that's a place where, uh, I don't know if we're lacking soul, but we're lacking people with soul doing the work. And uh, but what are your thoughts on that? Well, I'm reminded of the scene in the movie Inside Job where uh, Charles Ferguson asks Nouriel Roubini, why didn't they see the why didn't they see what was going on? And he said, well, if they would have uh, Roubini looks at him kind of wryly and he says, well, if you, they had really looked at it, they would have found the culprits, meaning that's <laughs> what they were trying not to do. Right. And what I think you're hitting at, I talked about the four things, errors of commission and marketing, omission, hiding in the monastery with your tools and uh, demagoguery in an era of uncertainty. There is a fifth, and you just named it. The separability between economics and politics is a mirage. And what is really harming the United States of America and many other places are two things. One, the multinational environment allows all the money to be offshore. People aren't as mobile as technology and finance, so you can arbitrage one society against each other to in a race to the bottom, including environmental constriction. We don't have proper governance. But within the United States, the commodification of social design, who gets appointed, who enforces the rules and how, what are the laws, what are the regulations, is creating a system, particularly as the concentration of wealth increases, that is unrepresentative of the society, and it's systematically so. And the problem with it is it's an amplifying feedback loop. The more the system results, say congressional policies or whatever, exacerbate inequality, cut taxes for the rich, go from being tax evasion to allowing you to keep your money, which is a crime, to keeping your money in tax avoidance offshore and then preaching about how we can't afford it. And as those things happen and concentration of income and wealth accelerates, then the number of people who control philanthropy, the number of people who lobby, the, and I put large corporations in this mix as well, the people who can determine the survival of elected representatives becomes more and more dependent on a narrow spectrum of society. And it's not particularly, um, which you might call novel to expect them to do things that disproportionately serve themselves. So I think we have a huge, huge challenge. And some of the structure of these bailouts and some of the ignoring of the people like Elizabeth Warren and the others that you mentioned with good ideas is a testament to what Donald Trump said. It was almost his bumper sticker that got him elected. The system is rigged. And right. everybody feels that. And the Democratic Party centrists are stale 
But, but they're stale because they're coping. They're trying to survive in a bad system where the incentives related to money are too large in related to representing voters. And I mean, Donald Trump took apart 15 Republicans before he went on against Hillary Clinton. But I, I think this systemic problem uh, trivial at all, because you can have a good idea up against a bad idea, and the bad idea helps 2% of the, pop the population with all the money and wealth. That's what we do. And that is not, I mean, I, I mean you heard, you said it earlier, I'm trained as an engineer. You're supposed to have a feedback system which recognizes deviations and errors and maladies in the system and gives, and gives you information and you correct. We're not evolving in the United States in these last few years. There's a lot of how would I say, potential, possibility. My friends say we love the robots because in Sweden, they don't protect jobs, they protect people. In the United States, people are ter terrified, terrified of uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, globalization, austere fiscal budgets, uh, and financialization. And with some good reason, because the adjustment assistance is not part of our social contract at this juncture. And and because we don't test that feedback loop, Rob Johnson, uh, we don't realize uh, that the system is working f as it's designed for the 2% or the 0.5%, but not for the 99.5%. So we're not... Well, if we do test, we're probably not testing for the right things. Well, and we're running out of time, Rob, but before we go, since we both love music, uh, what are you using for bumper music on your podcast, Economics and Beyond? Oh, well, I, I open with a song by a man named Willie King, who I recorded as a blues artist in Aliceville, Alabama. And the song I use is called Second Coming. And, it, and the opening lyric, lyric is you can kill my body but mess with my mind you can kill my body you can't mess with my mind because i'm going to be back i'll be back for a second second time and the uh the the outro is bob dylan from hard rain's gonna fall and it's a uh, a message towards the end uh He's observing uh, men in society, as you probably recall. Uh, it was written at a time to nuclear. As no one comes down the stretch and, he, and he's talking, where the people are many, the hands are empty, the pellets of poison are flooding the waters, where the where the home in the valley meets, meets the is where well hid, where hunger are forgotten, where black is the color and none is the number. And then after that is what we pick up, and it goes like this. And I'll tell it and think it and speak it and breathe it and reflect it from the mountain so all souls can see it. Then I'll stand on the ocean until I start sinking, but I'll know my well before I start singing. Well, that seems like a good place to wind this up. So Robert Johnson, uh, Executive Director of the Institute for New Economic Thinking, where can people find uh, your podcast, Economics and Beyond? You could, it's uh, on Apple, Spotify, Google, and all of those different type of podcast sites under the name Economics and Beyond with Rob Johnson. Uh, you can also find it at ineteconomics.org. All right. Well, Rob, I'm glad you're doing that. It's going to be uh, uh, rewarding to listen to it. So, Robert Johnson, uh, thanks for coming on the program. Well, thanks for having me, RJ. And I watch your work and I love your work and uh, I'm going to have to have you as my guest sometime on my podcast. Anytime, brother. Anytime.